will be recorded. There we go. So, um, so both those papers will be recorded, but the conversation, the discussion afterwards will not. Um, so we um, should really make a start now. <laughs> and um, very welcome to the IHR and to this exciting seminar where um, our two speakers tonight have come together to examine um, uh, queer histories in Spain itself completely under-researched and also um, queer histories pre and post the Franco regime, so the 1960s and the 1970s. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Javier Cuevas. Javier is an assistant professor of art history at the University of Malaga in Spain. He's also part of the University Institute for Research on Gender and Equality. Um, he recently was director of the research project based at Malaga called Cruising Torre Molinos mm. and um, is the editor of a recent book called Cruising Torre Molinos with a rather, rather brash cover on this. I've, yeah. I've seen this before, uh, which I was going to pass around with the yeah. little room. You might as well have a look. And uh, Javier is talking to us mm. tonight um, on Spanish queer histories during the Franco uh, dictatorship. And he's brand new evidence um, from uh, the special court of vagrants and thugs in Granada in the 1960s. Our second speaker tonight is Onya Mantis Rafos, who's um, a Catalan Canadian historian based at Carlton University and is specializing in oral history, mapping methodologies, and also the history of queer life in Barcelona uh, after the Franco regime during the 1970s. Okay, so uh, Javier, if I could hand over to you to make a start. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have my time to. So I don't know if I can put this out. Okay, so I would like to um, start by thanking Tom Brady and uh, Craig Griffith for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, seminar with Ona, whose work I admire. Um, I don't know how can this out. Uh, uh, okay, perfect. There we go. So that's nice to see the presentation. Yes, okay. So, um, I belong to a, a research uh, project called the Desnordadas, disoriented into the um, in University Institute for Research on Gender and Equality. And I also uh, have been um, working for years with a group of Spanish queer researchers, historians, between them, um, our colleagues, Geoffroy Ward and Javier Fernandez uh, Galeano have helped me in this research project process. Uh, we have recently published this book, Las Locas en el Archivo, Disidencia Sexual Bajo el Franquismo, Sexual Dissidents Under, um, under Franco. Um, I am going to uh, present our work in progress research. So I will outline the main lines and welcome any comments and suggestions. So I start in here, um, April 1961, Pilar, a 20-year-old woman from Granada, single and a student commits suicide in a central hotel in Barcelona. The forensic investigation determined that her death was due to drug intoxication while the police investigation focused on her group of friends in the Andalusian city of Granada, four invertidos homosexuals whose statements were taken and legal proceedings were opened against them. Also, two personal photographs and a total of 18 letters written in the days, in the days prior to her friend's suicide were seized. The um, Provincial Historical Archive of Malaga Holds the judicial files of the Special um, Court of Backgrounds and Thoughts of Granada, among which are the documents of this case. The research focuses on the relation between letters and personal photographs and the institutional archive. These files can be only consulted in the archive after 50 years, half lives, and private information must be protected, even in these cases. For this reason, I have replaced the original names with fictitious ones and kicked out all information that can reveal the identity of the accused. 
Uh, here you can see um, an example. For its part, Archive has carried out anonymization work on the documentation, including the letters and photographs on which I will focus. I will show you um, a brief chronology of the events um, that you can see here on this slide. Pilar committed suicide on April 1961. Uh, in the beginning of June, the court in Barcelona proceeds the case and informed the judge of vagrants and thoughts on, in Granada of her links with her inverted friends. At the end of June, the Granada judge called John and Michael to testify and, as usual in these cases, asked for reports from the police and the civil court. In January 1967, they were sentenced for homosexuality. John was sent to Granada Provincial Prison for three months from January to April 1967, and Michael was held for one month in August 1967 in the provincial prison of Malaga. When both were released from prison, the second security measure was applied to them to live for five years, 67, 72, outside in the city of Granada. Now, I will, um, I said some biographical details of these uh, people. Uh, John uh, was 20 years old uh, at the time of his arrest. Uh, he was born in a village of the province of Jaén in Andalusia, but he lived in Granada. According to the police report, he was inverted and frequented homosexuals, mainly foreigners. Although he was not working at the time of his arrest, he had studied up to fourth grade and was waiting to be called up by the, um, the Air Force, to which he had applied to John. In his letters, he often referred to himself in the feminine as Joan, uh, the daughter of the rising sun. Michael was 19 years old at the time of his arrest. He was born in Granada. According to the police report, he had a bachelor's degree in science and worked for a telephone company. And Paul is another friend whose file was opened, although it is not kept in the archive. We don't know where is it. He was 20 years old and studied up to fourth year of high school. In the letters, the one that you can see um, in the slide, and other documents in the file, other people are named, including Peter de Franciscan, uh, who at the time of the arrest was in the region of Extremadura. He was expelled from the Granada Seminary, where he was studying precisely because of his relationship with his group of friends and uh, Pilar. Uh, in the slide, you can uh, see one of the letters and the drawings John made of himself and Paul in the bottom part of the of the letter and he says I will send you some pictures of the ones I took today now I'm sending you a close-up of Paul and me. Uh, as I said before Pilar uh, was um, well 24 uh, years old at the time of her suicide uh, she was single and a student. I will explain now a little bit about the um, material analysis of the letters and photographs. Um, and there were, um, there are, in fact, 18 letters with their envelopes and two personal black and white photographs, and all of them preserved in, within the file. The letters are those written and sent um, by Pilar's friend from Granada, the city where they lived, to Barcelona, the city where she lived. Some are individual letters, uh, such as those sent by her friend John, and other are collective letters written by two, three, or even four people. Um, in fact, one of Pilar's aunt um, is also mentioned in the letters. She is the only member of the family who had kept in contact with her. This uh, issue is crucial for the police report and the judge a decision as they consider her ways of life to be dangerous as they endanger the function of the traditional family. In addition, the typed copy of um, that Pilar wrote to them before committing suicide is also preserved. Well, the letters, envelopes, and photographs are numbered from 1 to 80, 
in the upper right hand corner, which was written when they were included in a court file. We can see here one example with the number 24. In addition to the right, uh, written text, the letters include numerous drawings, magazine clippings, and even hand stitch photographs. The letters are handwritten on different types of paper and with different types of pen. It is also possible to distinguish different types of calligraphy connected to each other uh, uh, of the friends, to the different friends. The envelopes, in addition to the one peseta postage stamp with Franco's face, have the postmark of the Court of Barcelona, which sent all the documentation to the Special Court of uh, Granada. Here we can see one uh, example. And for the photographs, they include some comments on the back. Here we have one example too. Um, this photograph showing the three friends descending a staircase. We can read the date, March 13, 1965, and the following text written by John. It says in Spanish, Nos te triste y alegrate, te ríes, don't be sad and be happy. Are you laughing? We must uh, highlight the enormous contrast between the process of production and circulation of these letters and photographs and the archives which they are kept in. The contrast between um, police and judicial terminology and the terminology used by the group of friends is also striking. These letters and photographs uh, travel and circulated until they were arrested, filed and archived. So the rare circulation of the contents of these letters and drawings is, we can say, an exercise of liberation. Then, um, then as I said before, this is a work on pro, um, a work in progress. So I have organized the information in, of these letters, as you can see in here. Maybe this um, index can change in the in the next days or or weeks. Um, as I said before, the information is very broad, and but I have organized these four uh, points, pregnancy, abortion, and spiritism, uh, queer references, Torre Molinos, our Sodom, and cultural references. I'm going to name just to say a little bit about uh, uh, these four points. I start with the first one that I have called pregnancy, uh, abortion, and spiritism. One of the central uh, themes of the correspondence is as unwanted pregnancy and the possibility of abortion, as well as a possible sexually transmitted infection. Pilar uh, received the letters from her inverted friends in Granada, hesitating between having an abortion or not, submerged in a deep sadness and with continuous suicidal thoughts that would end up materializing. Uh, her friends ask her about the size of her belly uh, while referring to a mutual friend whom I will call Carmen, uh, who they say also intends to have an abortion, although she will eventually give birth. We can also see how at a certain point um, they change the way they refer to Pilar on the front of the envelope from Senorita to Senora Doña, from uh, Miss um, uh, to Mrs. Uh, the amused tone used by uh, her friend John when referring to this change shows an effort to make the matter less dramatic and more bearable for to her friend. Uh, in this uh, context, um, her friend John said, if you had decided to tortillar, which is a Spanish expression for uh, having sex between women, um, tortillar from omelette, um, you wouldn't be pregnant today. So uh, this issue which dominates the content uh, and tone of the letters takes on new meanings when we read the uh, forensic medical report which indicates that she was not pregnant. One of the hypotheses we have is that she had previously interrupted the pregnancy without telling her group of friends and that as a result of her depression, she committed suicide. That is one hypothesis. Uh, we can speak about this later. Furthermore, in conversations on this subject, they talk about the possibility of doing spiritism to talk uh, to loved ones in the afterlife. In one of the letters, John tells Pilar that, quote, the dead are very strange. 
they didn't answer any of the question I asked them, end of quote. And later he adds, quote again, a candle has gone out. Could it be my, our stranger? In Pilar's farewell letter to them, she says, I am going to ask you a favor, although I no longer believe that anything exists. After this life, please cultivate spiritism and I will come and talk to you every time you invoke me so that at least we will be united. This um, matter, which could be a joke between friends, uh, we can make different inter interpretations, takes on enormous importance in the statements made by John and Michael before the judge in which it can be seen how they are asked about this subject, to which the former Michael replies, I mean, they declare before the court, that they have never practiced spiritism, as this was only an indication from Pilar and Michael, that they have not held any spiritism meeting, although when Pilar was in Granada, she suggested that they hold one, having proposed it several times, but without it even being carried out. So the second point, uh, which I mean, queer references, um, we can be speaking about this uh, for a lot of time, but well, uh, I will try to summarize it. Um, the references to elements of Andalusian popular, uh, popular culture read, read as queer, are varied and numerous. On many occasions, they refer to the way they dress, as you can see here, um, with peineta and mantilla, uh, while on other occasions, they talk about the way they smoke cigarettes with the golden cigarette holder. Um, by the way, a mantilla is a tra the traditional, right? A Spanish silk veil over the head and shoulders, as we can see in this, um, um, in this letter, in this photograph, um, often over a high comb called peineta, no? popular very with, with between women in Spain as well as in Latin America. I would like to read. I like this um, letter a lot. I think I, it's my favorite one because you can uh, read the, the part of the letter and how in the middle of it you have this uh, white and black photograph, uh, which is. Um, strength by the uh, by John with these beautiful colors and you can read all around it. Dear Pilar, as you can see, we are already in Eastern and I am sending you my Mantilla photo. Do you like it? My greatest wish would be that you were with us at this time so that you could see me. You look, I look divine. Sorry. The mantilla is from my mom, the peineta from my grandmother, may she rest in peace, and the flowers from my admirers. So I like the way uh, he connects the text and the image, uh, both of them produced by um, himself. Um, as I said before, we could be um, uh, no, speaking about this for a lot of time, but the queer rereadings of elements of Andalusian popular culture, such as Mantilla or Beineta, is very present throughout the 20th century. Although the best known examples are those of Andalusian artists such as um, Ocaña and Nazario, key figures in the development of the Barcelona counterculture of the 70s. Uh, there are also references to. Um, well, I, I have choose also some uh, personal photos from the website Torremolinos Chic, where you can find a lot of personal photos of Torremolinos in the 60s. And I think this one um, is perfect because we can see how the both of um, these two people, they are playing with the mantilla you know, and connects with the, the image that we have on their right. And there are also references to the European fashion of the time, identifying and with different actors and actresses of European pop culture. Um, here we have some other examples, maybe and we can come back to, to them later. And uh, in some other examples, um, we can see how uh, letters and drawings were used to describe the parties they organized uh, at the friend's house. In this, guy, in this case, they are organizing a spring party and you can see how he uh, described himself next to the drawing. He says, 
we all have to dress very spring-like and I have drawn my outfit for you. I made it with Violet Piper, the trousers, the flowers at the bottom are green and the one in the middle is yellow. The one that covers my breast is of all the colors and the headdress is also violet. And on my ears, I have very uh, cute and simple earrings, blah, blah, blah. Now at the party, Miss Spring 66 will be elected with the right um, to a sash and a kiss of honor. So well, I just uh, wanted to show you a few um, examples. Um, um, I will well just say that uh, very fast. Uh, there are also references to her um, bisexuality uh, when in a, her farewell letter she said that a good friend of her looked at her at Pilar. A quote, as you know, she looks with desire, and I also desire her. And I decide her at this moment. However, we will never sleep together. Uh, she is always um, speaking this way. Well, then the third point uh, that uh, I call Torremolinos, our Sodom, the references to Torremolinos in Malaga as a queer meeting place are constant in these letters. Uh, Granada is just an hour and a half away from Torremolinos. Um, the police reports. Uh, submitted to the judge point to the interest of these young men in relationships with other men, especially foreigners, for whom they charge money. In other words, they were taberos, the Spanish term for male homosexual prostitution. Indeed, in the correspondence, we find this type of comment, for example, when John says, quote, they have lost the number of men and flats he has known, and um, that he left with 100 pesetas and came back with 10,000 pesetas, end of quote, or in another letter in which he comments that, quote, his friend Antonio will come to see him at Eastern, but first I will go to our Sodom. Sodom, no? the definition of Torremolinos as our Sodom shows the place it occupied in the imagination, not, all, not only of this group of friends, but also in the context of the Spanish queer history, you know, in the 60s, especially in the 60s. Well, I will um, finish with a, a fourth uh, point that I call the cultural references. Um, uh, the letters also provide very interesting information about queer meeting places in Granada in the second half of the 60s. Among them is the Café Suizo, the place from which the letters were often written. Uh, on other occasions, uh, the letters were written directly from the post office uh, before being posted or sent. Um, for example, they say this café, Café Suizo, had a quote, great atmosphere, lots of cathedros, provisions, lots of foreigners, and a pleasant air. They also mentioned cinemas in Granada and the films they saw there. For example, uh, well, here you have a, a lot of examples. I will just uh, stop in some of them. Uh, in the Granada cinema, the French film last year at Marion Band, um, uh, what I think is interesting is that he makes a comment on the film, but he also includes uh, what a film critic says about it. John says, it's a film that you understand absolutely nothing about, but it's worth seeing for the music and the, the cinematography. And he adds what film critics says about it. Don't pretend to understand this film. Last year in Marion Valley is aimed only at the eye and the heart. This is a letter number nine. Also the British film Return from Ashes. Uh, of this film, John says, I love the male character. Uh, he loved women, not for them, but for their money. He could have ended up a multimillionaire, but as it was a film, in the end, he was discovered by the police. Other examples, the uh, American uh, film Harlow, uh, where he says about this, it is a good film apart from a few slow scenes and also, just, uh, to name a Spanish one, um, they say they, he said, because most of these letters were written by John, that uh, he went to Cine Gran Vía, uh, where they saw this Spanish film, Los uh, Tarantos, no? that was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film in the Oscars. Just to, uh, of course, they mentioned too, uh, Pilar says in the farewell letter that. Uh, 
last night she went to to uh, to watch Thorba the Greek in in Barcelona because it is uh, written by her. And just I will end it up by uh, just saying something very brief about the poetry written by them in the letters, mm -hmm. and also. Uh, we find some references to other poets, such as Shakespeare or Cernuda. Um, for example, in the heading of the letter 18, uh, he writes this poem from Luis Cernuda, Su memoria de hombre, luego nada, divinas la sombra de luz siguen con la tierra que gira. And uh, also uh, uh, a short part of a sonnet 34 by Shakespeare, Those tears are pearls with which the love sheets uh, and they are rich and ransom in all ill deeds and he includes so don't make me cry and write to me damn it uh, so uh, we can uh, i would like to finish by saying that um although some of these letters uh, have not been preserved it can be deduced from some of them uh, that pilar sent them poems so, because John says, your poetry is fabulous. I got the impression that when you wrote it, you were very sad and depressed. Am I mistaken? So, and from uh, other letters, it is clear that one of the friends, Lauren, makes portraits. I have just done one for Auntie, another friend named and feminine. This way of naming friends in feminine uh, will be crucial for the police investigation as the statement shows how they ask her who the auntie was and if they had meetings at her uh, house. Uh, and just I will finish um, and maybe we can speak a little bit more in the in the discussion by saying something about the photos. The analysis of the photographs will take us a long time, but in this case, I would like to mention an important issue in one of the photographs, which has not been preserved, but which we know from descriptions of it in letters such as 12, pillars appears in trousers. This matter will be decisive for the police report as it will define a type of modern woman with existentialist ideas and therefore a danger for um, the nation. So I'm going to stop here. I have more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, well, more letters and documents, but I think I'm going to stop here and maybe we can continue in the, in the discussion. Happy end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, look, can you hear me? You can, yes? Yes, I can. That's great. And you're, are you ready to go? Um, yes, I think I should. Uh... That's super. Then, then with great pleasure, I'm going to introduce your paper. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Ona Bunches Rafos is based at uh, Carlton University in Canada. It's great to have her online with us today. And Ona's going to talk to us about oral histories of queer Barcelona in the 1970s. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as uh, Sean mentioned, my focus, uh, on, my research focus is on Barcelona in the 1970s, um, and I'm generally interested in where identity, community, and geography intersect. Uh, so that will be the focus of this talk, um, as well as unpacking some of the changes and continuities in queer life and activism within and since the 1970s. So my sources are oral history interviews uh, with artists and activists that I conducted in Barcelona in 2021, um, who, with people who lived in Barcelona between the 1960s and 1980s, more or less. I also draw on magazines, posters, flyers, bulletins, and photographs. Uh, from some municipal archives as well as community archives in Barcelona. So I focus on the 1970s uh, because I find it a really fascinating moment for the multiple transitions that are happening at this time, particularly the political transition um, at the end of the Spanish dictatorship. So Spain was under a military Catholic dictatorship from 1939 up until the death of the dictator Franco in 1975. Um, and so this begins kind of this uneasy moment of transition. Um, and I use the term the transition in a kind of broad chronological sense. Um, there are some who 
would put it very strictly between 1975 um, when Franco died and 1978 with the passing of the new Spanish constitution. Um, but I think this kind of misrepresents this moment by giving it a def def definitive beginning point and end point. So I use it kind of more broadly to refer to this sort of ambiguous um, moment of transition. One of the interesting things that kind of results from this moment of transition is you have these really broad solidarities between different activist groups. Um, so including among kind of gay liberation activists um, who have a common enemy in the dictatorship. But as the political transition advanced um, and you had something maybe hinting at uh, dem democracy or democratic institutions, um, then you have these increasing tensions about who are we fighting how do we fight? Uh, what tactics should we be using? Um, and so I think that's a really, another really interesting aspect of the decade is that kind of sense of debate over how to um, fight for gay liberation. The 1970s are also often sometimes overemphasized um, in the sort of popular discourse around LGBTQ history in the Spanish state is this idea of it being where um, queer life activism um, and culture sort of emerged. Um, but obviously that uh, would not be true as many researchers have shown, including Javier, who has, uh, you have the pleasure of hearing from today. Um, and so this is, is clearly a moment of creating mythologies around queer activism, which I find really interesting. So I think it's actually that idea of creating these myths and legends um, and kind of these iconic images that will become so integral to the story of LGBTQ um, history in the Spanish state uh, that makes me really interested in the 1970s and I think makes it worth re, re taking a closer look at it and digging deeper into some of the nuances. I'm going to give some key dates, uh, but they're not sort of the most important or the only <laughs> important dates. Um, but I wanted to mention that in 1970, the Law on Social Danger and Rehabilitation was passed, which recriminalized um, homosexuality, as well as other things considered social dangers. Um, so other people considered social dangers like sex workers, drug users, or the unemployed. Um, and in response to this law, you have the Spanish Movement for Homosexual Liberation um, being created in 1971 by a few upper class um, men in Barcelona. And initially this group has kind of a moderate um, politics, I would say, but as more people come into the group from kind of communist backgrounds, um, feminist, lesbian perspectives, uh, then they, the politics of the group kind of changes and they have some new ideas about what, uh, what they're really trying to do here. And in 1975, they kind of rebrand, you could say, um, they choose the name of Gay Liberation Front of Catalonia. 1977 is remembered as the year of the first gay rights march, um, which was organized by the FAGC um, and took place in Barcelona. Um, and in 1975, the FAGC celebrated the removal of homosexuality from the um, law on social dangers, although the law itself was not repealed until, um, until the 1990s. Um, and gay and trans people were still being uh, policed under different laws uh, throughout that period. So from the, the installment of the dictatorship in 1939 into the transition period, the Francoist regime put enormous effort into maintaining strict control over public space, um, particularly in regards to expressions of gender and sexuality. Um, and all of my interviewees described this sensation of knowing that there were always watching eyes um, between the presence of police on the streets um, and porters and on, in doorways that would inform on your activities to the police. Um, and homosexuality was considered a foreign disease to be cured through prison labor, um, psychologists and Catholicism. Um, and so this is, there were very direct consequences or as well as indirect consequences consequences to the surveillance, right? That there were these um, outcomes that were violent um, and in many intimate ways. 
So despite uh, this context of policing, there remained in uh, in Barcelona a lively scene of cabarets of, and clubs mm -hmm. with drag performance, particularly in the southern portion of the Raval neighborhood, um, which was known for these, these cabaret clubs throughout the 20th century. Um, and one of the people I spoke to was Enrique Majo Miro, an activist and early, um, an actor and an early activist of the Gay Liberation Front of Catalonia. Um, and he described how drag performers in the 1960s negotiated gender policing. So he described how they would be in a full face of makeup with you know, very long false eyelashes, um, necklaces, wearing these beautiful open blouses, but they would be wearing pants to stick to kind of the letter of the law. Enrique also described the rich variety of different kinds of performance um, that could be seen in these clubs, including cabaret performers from France that would stop in Barcelona. And Enrique described them as sort of unlike anything he'd ever seen before and really opening his eyes to um, different kinds of art um, and different ideas of sexuality. Um, he also loved the performances of Pavlovsky, a comedian uh, from Argentina who wore fabulous outfits and Enrique described as so funny that the audience loved being insulted by him. And um, we have a couple of photos of Pavlovsky on the right there. Um, Franco's death in 1975 uh, impacted the culture of performance in the Raval, as audiences had an appetite for everything that had been censored and outlawed under the regime. Um, one iconic performer, Dolly Vandal, has been recorded as saying she enjoyed the demure playfulness of her shows in the 1960s, and she expressed frustration that they went out of style so suddenly. Um, B.B. Anderson, on the other hand, um, is remembered as kind of embracing this new style that became popular. Um, she was confrontational, sexually explicit, and became such an icon of the 1970s that um, some even kind of appropriated her image to turn her into a symbol of the transition as a whole. At a walking distance from all these cabarets and clubs were bars where men would go to drink and dance together. Um, and bars came up in many of my interviews as important spaces for socialization, for seeing oneself represented, and for dancing with someone you liked. Most of the gay bars for men were located in the old city. Um, the architecture of the Raval made it an ideal setting for queer leisure spaces and cruising, um, but it also made it a target for suspicion and police raids. But it was also a space of violence as much as it was kind of a free space. There were also controversies over who was allowed in these spaces. Um, most of the lesbians I spoke to expressed frustration over the spaces that they called supposedly mixed, um, but that they felt unwelcome and heard sort of comments that were sexist or, or lesbophobic in some way. And, and so they actually didn't remember these spaces as anything freeing or anything sort of welcoming for them. And they instead remembered um, Daniels. Daniels was a lesbian bar that opened in 1977. Um, and women came here from all over the city, um, including Vivettes from the Raval's cabarets. Um, and it was located in the upper part, part of the city in contrast to gay men's bars, which were in the old city. Um, and so they were kind of kept safe through this middle class respectability that was afforded by the owner as a resident of that middle class neighborhood. Um, and in this way, we're able to avoid kind of violent police raids that bars and clubs in the Raval often suffered. However, they were not free from police. They had a red light above the door and um, whoever was manning the door, if they saw someone who looked like they were probably police, uh, coming, they would the red light would turn on, the music would stop, everyone would stop dancing, stop touching. Um, they'd bring out card games and board games, um, and so the policeman would come in and he would just see, you know, a room full of women playing innocently playing board games. He would have a drink, he would leave, and then the music would turn back on. They'd start dancing again, kissing and touching. Um, this is something that Dulos Majoral uh, described to me, um, a lesbian activist who remembered Daniels very fondly. Um, and she did also mention that the, these kind of police visits did end at a certain point in the 1980s, 
However, um, they were replaced by police infiltration. So they later found out that there were police women who were sent into Daniels um, to find out you know, what was going on in these spaces and infiltrate all these lesbian circles, um, supposedly to protect the new state from potential terrorist threats. So nearly every person I spoke to referenced the Ramblas as an important site for LGBTQ memory, even if it was not a place that they had personal attachment to. Um, and this is Okanya, you can see here on the left um, of this image and on the far right is Nathario, um, both uh, artists that Javier referenced um, in his uh, presentation. Um, and these are two people that Enrique, um, one of the people I talked to, mentioned as kind of presenting queerness as something to be celebrated and desirable um, because they would walk down the Ramblas in kind of, well, Arcania in particular, in these beautiful outfits and these beautiful dresses. Um, and people around them, regular people, would just adore it. Right. And that was something that Enrique had never seen before of this idea of seeing queerness and flamboyance so obviously demonstrated, but sort of loved by everyone around them rather than just tolerated or um, indeed sort of rejected. This was made famous by the Trat Intermitin, a film by Gwendola Pons that was released in 1978. That um, dot in this film, uh, this photo on the right is a still from that um, film. And this became such a famous kind of symbol of queer um, Barcelona in the 1970s that it has sometimes meant that it's become more of a symbol than anything else um, in terms of it reduces all of these kind of people and their lives and culture to just representing Barcelona in the 1970s rather than really going into the nuance and complexity of their lives and identity. The Ramblas um, that Ocaña walked down and is so famous for walking down were also the site of the 1977 march um, that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so the Gay Liberation Front of, of Catalonia um, organized this march on June 26th, um, and there were an estimated 4,000 marchers and considerable press attention, more than even they imagined. Um, and the image kind of this image of the demonstration in particular overtook sort of the march itself to become the representation of the gay liberation movement um, in general in the 1970s um, in some ways to the frustration of some of the activists themselves at the time because the march was headed by trans women and travestis and they appeared in most of the published photographs of the march um, and this angered some portions of the Gay Liberation Front of Catalonia who felt this was not the image they wanted to give of the movement and that their concerns would not be taken seriously because of, because of it. Since then, many of these same activists have changed their stance and recognized the bravery of these women at the front of the march. But at the time, this formed some of the tensions between activists that only worsened in subsequent marches to the point that 1979 saw two separate marches take place. The official march of 1979, organized by the Gay Liberation Front of Catalonia and other groups, took place on the other side of the Raval, um, on the Parallel. But the coordinator of collectives for gay liberation, the CCAG, chose to march on the Ramblas. By doing this, they tied in Ocaña's Ramblas and the 1977 march into their own 1979 occupation of this street. And um, in this way, we're in a sense legitimizing the CCAG within the canon of queer resistance as the one true gay rights movement. Um, this demonstrates the iconic status that the Ramblas had acquired um, in the story of sort of LGBTQ community in um, Barcelona, but it also is demonstrative of the difficulties in activist organizing at the closing of the decade. So all, nearly all of my interviews reference the Ramblas at some point um, as a space that was iconic and sort of remembered as a, a space that needed to be commemorated. 
Um, but the spaces that they spoke about most passionately as sort of me having meaning for them as lesbians or gay men, um, they were often harder to locate. They were unphotographed spaces and part of a personal experience rather than a collective movement. One example of that is Maria Giral, a lesbian activist who founded a lesbian group within the um, FAGC, the Barcelona Lesbian Collective. One of the moments that she was most animated in our interviews was when she talked about walking central streets of Barcelona with her lesbian friends. They faced nearly da near daily harassment um, just for walking down the streets, holding hands or kissing. Um, but she also was very clear that they made the conscious decision to hold hands and kiss and be affectionate in public spaces, deliberately making their lesbian, lesbian identity visible. Um, and they were prepared with batons, sprays, and their fists to defend that lesbian identity from homophobic and sexist men on the street. That violence was not something that Maria was nostalgic for, but it was clear that this fighting was an expression of lesbian pride. Um, and it informed the way she walks, informs the way she walks the city today even. Um, so for her, she remembers it as something that was about defending identity and solidifying community through physically fighting um, people on the street. Enrique also talked about um, this kind of the street as a source of empowerment. Um, not so much the demonstrations, but the clandestine work that he did for the FAGC. Um, so he remembered how in the early years of the, fa uh, the FAGC, they drew on tactics of communists. They used code names and were grouped into cells um, so that if they were caught and tortured, they could only give up the names of a small portion of the members. Um, and each cell would go to a different neighborhood to place posters to avoid being recognized by their neighbors. And Rick described them as fun nights. He said they were fun nights because it was like playing cat and mouse with the police, um, but you always knew that you were right. And so that was a sense of kind of defiance in the street that was deeply personal for his sense of self and for his sense of pride. And on the right, you have an example of one of the posters that Enrique might have been putting up in Barcelona, um, on the Barcelona streets. The artist, Natalia Luque, um, that Javier mentioned, he remembers the street as a site of empowerment in a different way as a place where he found a sense of freedom and resistance in his sexual encounters in public spaces of the city in the 1970s. He moved there in, um, early in the early 1970s um, and he was originally from Andalusia. And one of the reasons why he decided to stop in Barcelona and live there was because of the street culture that he found, which he, in his opinion, was kind of more rich than anywhere else he had been in the Spanish state. Um, and in terms of cruising, in terms of the sex workers, and in terms of um, all this kind of life that was being lived on the street. And so for Natario, rather than going to bars or clubs of the Raval, he liked to spend time in the streets outside them. What interested him was not necessarily trans or gay identity categories, but rather a libertarian anarchist rejection of constraints, constraints on gender or sexuality as a whole and the culture of street cruising and sex workers was where he found his personal sense of belonging. There was always a danger of being caught or entrapped by police, so there was always a danger of violence, um, but that, that danger was part of what made it a defiant act, um, similar to Enrique in a way, that that was where it became resistance through that threat. From Marceo Pero, a lesbian activist I spoke to, she, a place she recalled fondly in the city was the phone booth. So her mental map of the city included phone booths. She talked about how whenever she was going anywhere, she always had an idea of where the nearest phone booth was and how she could um, get to it. And it was an important space for her because her first relationships were all through these public phones. Um, there was a space of privacy in the street where lesbian friendship and romance were shared across distance. She talked about how much emotion um, was centered around the phone booth for her, talking about, you know, whatever happened in a day, whatever she had gone through, um, whatever difficult thing she experienced, she just had to get to the phone booth. And she said, once I was there, I was saved. 
So in her testimony, the phone booth comes across as a kind of lesbian holy site, a conduit of lesbian love and community um, and this little bit of privacy in public space. So as we saw with Lolo, um, Lolo's Majoral stories about Daniels, um, police surveillance did not disappear with new government. It adapted with new strategies and concerns, um, but queer activists were regarded with suspicion long after the 1970s. And the tensions and disagreements that developed and transformed throughout the 1970s over who to fight and how to fight for gay liberation remained an important part of debate. And I would remain, I would argue that they remain an important part of debate today still, um, particularly in regards to marches and public spaces. We're still struggling with that question of who we're fighting and how to fight. Um, spaces of LGBTQ leisure and consumption in Barcelona moved to the upper city. Um, so kind of those gay bars are no longer in the Raval um, for the most part and no longer in that part of the city. But those areas still remain stigmatized. So I think there is that kind of sense of change and among different um, communities of how we're negotiating that kind of moral spatial politics. Um, but those same areas, those same kind of streets are still receiving um, a lot of stigmatization and marginalization in the city today, kind of marking that continuity with the 1970s as well. There's also been um, increasing street harassment in Barcelona, unfortunately, um, and attacks on vis visible LGBTQ spaces today. So one of the archives that I went to, the um, archives of the Centro LGBTI, um, when they opened, um, this is like a municipal center for um, LGBTQ community, when they opened, they had um, people paint like slow, uh, like hate speech on the windows and break the windows. Um, so even that kind of shows both these changes and that we have a municipal center um, for these issues, but at the same time, you have this reaction against it. That's quite strong. Marce, um, who I mentioned earlier, at the closing of our interview, she said, once you've explained it, you think things have changed a lot, but later when you think back on it, you think maybe what changed was you. And I think it's really interesting that she chose to kind of conclude our interview with this reflection um, and kind of shows how for everyone I spoke to, as much as they described changes in queer cultures and activism from the 1960s to the 70s, 80s, 90s, and today, um, they also insisted on the continuities in homophobic and transphobic oppression um, and the importance of continuing discussions over how to resist these oppressions. So from my research, I found that bars, clubs, and demonstrations are remembered as important sites of queer memory, but they're not the only spaces of importance. Um, for many of the people I spoke to, their strongest memories were less locatable, and sometimes less respectable. Um, and I think it shows the importance of looking beyond photographed spaces and moments because it allows for a more nuanced view of this transitional period. Um, and we need to think critically about how our popular memories or discourses are constructed um, and to think beyond the most photographed, most mappable moments and spaces in order to understand the past as something more multifaceted, personal and nuanced. I wanna thank the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada and Carleton University for funding this research um, and my thesis supervisor, Jennifer Evans, as well as Craig Griffiths and Sean Brady for making this happen. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Elena. That was a fabulous, fabulous paper. Um, unfortunately here in the Pollard Room in the IHR, um, the uh, laptop crashed and I heard it was also a power cut to half the building. So we actually lost about 10 minutes of your uh, discussion uh, this evening, unfortunately, but I'm very relieved indeed that we're recording all of this. So uh, um, for those in the room here, if we've missed out, we can listen to Ona's paper once it's uploaded online. Craig, so we stop the recording now and we can open up for questions. <laughs>